Last week we talked about search. We said we call it search and seizure because those two go together. We're going to talk focus a little bit more this week on the actual seizure portion of search and seizure. Uh, what, in my opinion, just talking to folks, just casually, I don't have a study to back this up. In general, folks, when they talk about when they think about seizure, they talk about seizure. They think about items, even in the same way that we just discussed it just now. You're going in and seizing whatever evidence that I said was in here: the dope, the pile of cocaine. Uh, the computer, the, the laptop, the phone, the items. We talk about seizing, searching, and seizing items. But one thing, one huge aspect of search and seizure that I want you to remember is that not all seizures, in fact, not even the majority of seizures uh, necessarily are items. It is absolutely a huge aspect of search and seizure is that we can be seized. And I don't mean kidnapped and taken to jail, per se. But Merely being able to lose our freedom, freedom of movement is a, is a key terminology. When we lose our freedom of movement, it can be said that we are being seized. The government has seized us. In much the same way that if I'm going down business 70 a little bit too fast and the trooper gets behind me and turns the lights on, am I legally free to go at that point? No. Physically, am I? Yeah, I mean, you can say I could run if I want. <laughs> My day is going to have some adverse uh, adverse endings, I'm sure, if I ran. But legally, I, am, I have no freedom of movement. I have to, the law says I have to pull over to the right of the road and stop till those lights are, are turned off. So that, that officer, that trooper, seized me. Why? Well, I, I touched on it. What happens if I don't? What happens if I don't pull over? What, what are the options? And at the end of that? Right. There's going to be, I'm, I'm probably, there's going to be some uh, uh, incarceration, some sort of punitive action. Some, the, the law is, right. There could be a use of force if I resist, things like that. There's just a ton of bad things. So I'm being compelled legally to do that. Do I feel, because I know all that, then I don't feel like I'm able to go? What if he never turned those lights on? What if he was standing on the side of the road? I'll give, a, a, again, extreme example, because the law, in order to prove points in the law, we have to use extreme examples to avoid gray area. What if that trooper was standing on the side of the road next to his car and I was speeding, legit, no, no purple, I was, I'm speeding. And he yells to me and says, hey, pull over as I drive by. That happened to me. <laughs> and my radio was on, I'm going, what is that, I think it's 55 on, on, on uh, business setting. I'm going 75. I'm going 75, he's on the side of the road with my radio on and he goes, hey, pull over. Is it likely that I heard that in this scenario? No, no probably not likely. So he determined that he gave me a lawful order to stop. I'm breaking the law and he gave me a lawful order to stop. But what don't I know? I didn't know that he asked you to stop. I didn't know. I didn't know that I was being detained. Mm -hmm. The key, one of the key aspects of being detained is that the person to be detained has to feel like they are not free to leave. If I'm driving down the road and I didn't hear anybody tell me to stop, I don't feel like I'm not free to leave. I'm just going to keep on down. Like the whiz, I'm going to ease on down the road. Because that's that's what I was doing. This guy kind of waved me over. He, he pulled that, that can yeah, and so <laughs> you can feel you have... So how can, let's talk about some ways that somebody can feel like they're not free to go. Or conversely, some ways that the government can tell us and make us feel like we're not free to go. I talked about one, those lights. And that's just traffic stops. I'm not, I mean, we can expand it. If, if a representative of the government came here, we'll say if a trooper came into this room and, was, and wanted me to be detained for whatever crime, for selling dope next to this podium. How could they make me feel like I'm not free to leave? 
Take a tummy. That's one. Yeah. Oh, so I'm trying to leave. I know they're here to see me. I'm like, I've got to get out of here. I can't. <laughs> I can't. And the trooper just keeps getting in my way. Would that give me the impression that I'm not free to leave if he kept blocking my path? Absolutely. What else? At that point, they're going to handcuff you. Handcuffs. If he puts handcuffs on me, he or she puts handcuffs on me. Do I feel like I'm free to go if I have custodial restraints on? No. Not generally. So you tell me, block my path, put custodial restraints on me. What about grabbing me? If he grabs me and doesn't let me move, do I feel like I'm free to leave? No. no. Do, I, do I have freedom of movement if I'm being grabbed? Any of those, any anything. However, what if the trooper knows that I'm under arrest? He knows he's going to arrest me. He, he watched me. They've been watching me sell dope through that window for weeks, and now it's time to arrest me. They come in here and they start talking about it. He knows I'm under arrest, but never tells me. I don't even know what's going on. I have no idea that I'm about to be arrested. Have I been detained? No. Until you get for you to Miranda, right? We're going to talk about Miranda in a second, but the answer is correct. It, it is no. It doesn't matter what the government knows. It doesn't matter what the officer knows. It only matters what the person to be detained feels. When we talk about the eye of the beholder, the only beholder that matters in this scenario is the one to be detained. The officer can know all they want, but if they don't say anything, it is still not in detention. That's the Mendenhall case. The Mendenhall case talked about the fact that in order for somebody to be lawfully detained, they are the ones who have to feel as though they aren't free to leave. And the example we used in uh, previously was the Stephanie Lazarus case. Stephanie Lazarus was the LAPD detective who was suspected of murder. On duty, they began to interview her. They used a ruse to detect other detectives, homicide detectives. She was an art theft detective. And many, many years ago, in fact, almost 20 years earlier, she had committed a murder. She murdered her ex-boyfriend's wife. So they dated, they broke up, he got married, and she killed She killed the, the wife. She was suspected of that crime. Detectives had enough evidence to go and detain her. They had her DNA, they finally, a cold case, DNA evidence came back, and it realized, oh no, that DNA from that murder 20 years ago is an LAPD detective now. So, they came up with an idea, and they told her, hey, uh, somebody in the jail uh, wants to talk to you, but they have information on an art theft. They want to talk to you. And when she got down there, she just took her gun off. There's not allowed a gun in jail. Took her gun off, went down to go interview him. There was nobody there to, to talk about art theft. It was just two homicide detectives that started asking her questions about this homicide 20 years ago. And she started answering some questions. Now, I'm going to pause that story right there because we want to talk about Miranda. When, do we, when does the government need to give a Miranda warning? Two-pronged test. I'm sorry? Interrogation is one prong. And custody, yes, being the same. Custody plus interrogation equals Miranda. Arrest does not equal Miranda. Tons of people get arrested and never have the rights read to them. It is not, an, it is not a loophole to get out of the arrest. As much as you see that on TV and movies, they let me go because they didn't, they didn't read my rights. They let me go because they didn't read me my rights. There's no law that says that somebody has to have their rights read when they're arrested. Because, as Sahir said, if you're not going to ask them any questions, there's no need to Miranda. Merely being arrested and driven to jail and put in a jail cell does not equal Miranda. You have to have that other component. The component of the government wants to ask you something. The government, if the government knows what you did or doesn't need any more evidence or is completely done with the investigation, just doesn't care what you have to say, 
no need to, to read any rights. Custody plus interrogation equals Miranda. Remember, custody doesn't mean arrest. It could be custodial restraints we talked about, lack of free movement. Uh, it's part of it, but not necessarily all detentions. There has to be custody. Custody is one step higher than detention. So I don't want you to say detention plus interrogation equals Miranda. It's custody, which is oftentimes arrest or custodial restraints, things like that. Merely being detained does not rise to the level of needing to Mirandize. Otherwise, every time a trooper pulled me over, stopped for speeding and said, hey, how, you know how fast you're going? If I answered, they wouldn't be able to use that because they didn't read me my rights. They're asking me a question, but I'm not in custody. I'm just being detained. So back to Stephanie and Lazarus, Detective Lazarus. They told her to go downstairs. Somebody wanted to talk to her about art theft when she got back, got down there. Surprise, there's nobody there. Just two homicides I want to talk to you about something that happened 20 years ago. Now, she was in that room expecting to talk to an art theft informant, and instead she's faced with two homicide detectives, and they just start asking her questions. At that point, those homicide detectives had her DNA in a bite of a homicide victim. Do they have enough probable cause, do you think, that this homicide victim, that this victim was shot and bit in a fight? And that bite mark has the DNA saliva of the husband's ex-girlfriend. With just those limited, and there's a ton more evidence, but just that limited amount of information, do you think there's a good chance that Stephanie Lazarus committed that murder? Yes. Good chance. Is there enough to detain her to further investigate that? Yeah. Is there enough to take her into custody even? I mean, you can put some handcuffs on her and then ask her some questions. Is that, I think it's all reasonable. I think we're all on the same page. Stephanie Lazarus could have been put in handcuffs, maybe even transported, and asked a bunch of questions. Could have been. And she asked to leave at that point, but when she realized that there wasn't no um, body for her to speak to, um, then they would have had to read her rights if they wanted to ask well, those questions. So, so she came in there, she sat down, there's nobody there, just two homicide detectives are asking her, no art theft, asking her poignant, and there's no loopholes. And what I'm trying to say in this story is, I'm not trying to hide anything. I mean, they're asking her murder questions. They're not asking her any of that questions. They're asking her murder questions about a murder that they believe she committed, that they have evidence to, that would give them enough evidence to uh, lawfully take her into custody. But they didn't. They started asking questions. And I'm telling you now, they did not give her any Miranda rights. They did not read her her Miranda rights. Why? Why was that lawful? Why was it lawful for them not to read her any Miranda rights, even though they had enough evidence to take her to custody, and they are absolutely asking her questions that could incriminate her? Because she wasn't in custody. Consensual encounter. She wasn't in custody. She was absolutely consenting to that interview. She did. De facto consenting. Now, did they lie to her to get in there? Yeah. Absolutely. But she still, like you said, she could have got up and walked away. She might have gone far. In fact, she did. In another class, I showed the, vid the videos online on YouTube. You can watch her interrogation. It's, it's released. On YouTube, you can watch the Stephanie Lazarus interrogation. It lasted about an hour. After about an hour, she did exactly that. She got up and said, you know what? This is starting to get a little, and I'm paraphrasing here. Essentially, she said, this is starting to get a little too hot for me. I think I need to talk to my attorney about this. And she got up, and she walked out of that inter interview room. What do you think happened when she walked out of that interview room? Hey, Absolutely arrested her for murder. So I say all of that to go back to the Mendenhall. At what point was Stephanie Lazarus taken into custody? In that whole story, when did she get taken into custody? When she walked out there. When she, when she got there? No. I don't when know she, when she got there and never done it. How many they hit? I'm going to enter the room. I mean, because she had, they had taken everything from her at that point. But that lawfully. She so I will clear that up just a little bit because every single time that I go into the jail, I have to put my gun away. If I'm going to book somebody in jail, I, I can't, I'm not allowed. Policy says I can't take my gun into jail. So I have to put my gun in the locker. So the reason they lied to her and that used that ruse was just to get her to put that gun in the locker and go, go in there unarmed because they didn't want to interview an armed murder suspect. But the point in which she was legally detained, legally taken to custody, there, was that she walked out of it. Mm -hmm. So if we say custody plus interrogation equals Miranda, we never had custody until she walked out of the room. Was there any doubt in those two homicide detectives' minds that 
that she was she was going to be under arrest. No. In their mind, can we can we say can we agree? In their mind, she was already in custody. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is a done deal. If she sits down and says, "Forget you, I'm not talking," or she sits down and they walk in and says, "Oh no, I'm out," and never says one thing. They were still going to arrest her. In their minds, this is she's in custody, but it doesn't matter what's in their mind. It only matters what's in the mind of the person being detained or being taken into custody. And I'm using two slightly different terms because Miranda only applies to custody, but being detained is what we're talking about. In order for somebody to be detained, we said physically, blocking their path, using lights, even something as, as minor as uh, it can be putting a spotlight on somebody and make them feel like they are not free to leave because it's all in the mind. It's articulated in the mind of the person being detained. They can say, well, this thing that the government did made me feel like I, I wasn't free to go. Well, it doesn't matter what the officer. And it's in the same, we can flip that coin and say, an officer has blocked my path on accident. They're just trying to get around me and they're blocking me. Well, the officer said, well, no, no, I, I wasn't blocking their path. I, I, I didn't realize. Well, the officer could come in here and stand right here and not even realize where they're standing and start talking to me. Hey, do you want to consent to this? Uh, I want to ask you this interrogate, this uh, incriminating question, dot, dot, dot. Not even realizing in hindsight. Oh, oh no, I, I didn't realize I was blocking that door. I thought I thought I'm just having a consent. Well, I stood here, the officer could stand here and say, hey, do you mind if I talk to you? Literally ask for consent. But you know what? That would make me feel that like I'm, I'm, I'm being detained. Right? There you go. And it's in the eye of the beholder. The eye of the beholder is the person being detained, exactly. not the government. <laughs> so it works on both sides. We'll talk about what it takes to be in custody. Let's talk about what it takes. Let's define what it takes for what we find what it is to be detained. But what does the government need to detain us, to seize us temporarily? And that's what a detention is. It's a temporary seizure of our person. More, more, less temporary, or excuse me, less permanent than custody, far less permanent than arrest. So if we need, if arrest is more severe than a detention, we probably need a lower threshold of evidence from the government to detain us than they would to arrest us. We've already said in the past, in order to effect an arrest, we need probable cause. So less than probable cause would be reasonable suspicion. The government only needs reasonable suspicion to affect detention. Anybody want to venture a guess as how we would define reasonable suspicion? It is, uh, given the circumstances that a reasonable person would come to the conclusion that this crime had occurred, is being injured or is longer. In, in general, a set of facts that would lead a reasonable person, like Mr. Walt said, not just anybody, because you can always have arguments. That's the reason why I use extremes when I talk about the law, is because there's always an argument in the middle. So in order to avoid that argument in the middle, we say, well, what would a reasonable person believe? A set of facts that a reasonable person would believe would lead them to, would lead them to believe that a crime is being committed, was being committed or is about to be committed. And I would throw in, and the person to be detained is some way associated with that. And the government has to articulate that those um, circumstances. Right, there has to, they have to be articulated. So then we go into a more book definition. I, I like introducing things, yeah. talking it out. Okay. Let's give you, give you an idea. We don't need to use a lot of big words right away. I want you to understand that it's just a set of facts that would lead a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been committed, is being committed, or is about to be committed, and the person that's to be detained is some way associated with that crime. But the legal definition throws in that word that Ms. Scott talked about, articulable. They would say a set of articulable facts that would lead a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been committed, is being committed, or is about to be committed, and the person to be detained is in some way affiliated with that crime. That would be a more legal definition. Now, 
the idea that you can have an unreasonable person. If we're going to say that a reasonable person has to believe this, then you have to believe that there are unreasonable people. So we can spin a yarn and tell a story of, you know, I'm going to back up. Let's give an example of reasonability. Let's get away from traffic stops. We talk about traffic stops a lot. Let's talk about just two uh, police officers, two town police officers on patrol, seeing a person in the back of the Lowe's grocery store in Clayton. Two Clayton police officers seeing a, a person in the back of the Lowe's grocery store at three in the morning. They are in the rear, three in the morning, and they have a crowbar in their hand, walking in the alley. There's an alley behind, behind Lowe's, Lowe's grocery. And they've got a grow bar in their hand and they're walking alone. Uh, well, well, I'm going to rewind this story about five years before masks were cool. And they're wearing a ski mask. Ski mask, grow bar in hand, behind lows at three in the morning by themselves. And they have a backpack. This is all okay. So, is it illegal to own a backpack or wear a backpack at three o'clock in the morning? No. Is it illegal to be in the Lowe's parking lot? Well, that, that's technically the alley. Is it illegal to be in the alley there at three in the morning? No. Anything I list, I could go through that whole list, but we, did anything I list in that story, is there a law against any of those things? No. No, no exactly. Individually, no. Tell me more about that. This plays into the, uh, into the evidence for the suspicion of something. Because of these characters, because of these things you're wearing, the, the increments you had, the accoutrements that you had with you. I mean, if even being someone that gives somebody a wide breath, just thinking that guy's up to a family out right there. What, what do you think that guy's doing? In, in that imaginary story, what do you think he's up to? Um, that sort of painted, I think that being any Barson. Um, I would consider you and, and, and everybody in here a reasonable person. A reasonable person would believe that guy's up to no good. At the very least, up to no good. Uh, and in that definition, I'm going to go back and say the definition again, the legal definition. A set of articulable facts that would lead a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been committed, is being committed, or is about to be committed, and the person to be detained is in some way associated with that crime or affiliated with that crime. Anywhere in that definition did I tell you that you have to know what crime it is? Has to be a crime that you believe a crime is being committed. Uh -huh. So we don't need to necessarily, the government doesn't need to necessarily say, oh, he's definitely committing a burglary or definitely committing a grand theft. Just like Mr. Wall said, he's probably up to some sort of B&E, larceny, something theft related. But even that story, we don't know exactly what he's up to, but we just believe he's up to no good in our book. So do you think it's reasonable for the government to detain that person. Yes. yes. Um, he hasn't actually done anything to deserve him. No. Walking down the alley with a crowbar mask before masks were cool. But it's reasonable to with a backpack at three in the morning. Yeah, yeah notice you they say you're on patrol as I mean in, in a story, and mm -hmm. they don't notice that the, the suspect doesn't notice you. He hasn't actually committed a crime. Instead of going efficient, I mean, yeah, you're going to get a chance to start, you're going to get this collar, but if you watch him and then a few minutes later, he actually does break into some attendance on their brain. Absolutely. So you could, you have a couple of choices. You could Wait. continue and gather more evidence, more reasonable suspicion, or at some point that becomes probable cause to arrest because we said that probable cause is a higher threshold. At that point, so we, we agree for the most part, I didn't hear too many people disagree, that that person, a reasonable person, would say that 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 person with the the backpack, the hoodie, or so the backpack and the mask could be detained. But what I didn't ask you is, can we arrest that person for the panty and larceny? No, it hasn't happened. It hasn't so we, those are two different things. Then detained mm -hmm. and arrested are are by definition two different behaviors. Why? What what is the government going to do when they detain this person? Investigate. Investigate. What are they going to do if they have probable cause to believe a crime, that, that that crime occurred already? 
leave him alive. Yeah, they're just going to arrest him. Arrest him. There, there, there's, I mean, they could do further investigation as well, but detentions are for investigate, investigatory stuff. Detention. So the other choice, absolutely, they could watch him. And in a now, if we go to practicality, we could the uh, or investigative techniques. Sure, they could watch. They could see what happens. They could get plain clothes uh, assets to to watch. They could do you know what my team used to do: follow around burglars, things like that, and watch them commit crime. But then we have a couple different uh, challenges in that. Uh, if you are a homeowner or a business owner, in this case, if you if you if you own that load, are you cool with the officers just watching somebody break your stuff? No, probably not. So the catch twenty two, like yeah, you want the crime, but are you cool? like when the officer could have stopped them? It, it may be a challenge for sure. So, so we know that if they're supposed to be there for preventative measures and it's my business, I'm going to be like, okay, so where are you at in preventing it? There you go. <laughs> so that story is a very uh, poignant example of. Remember, there are three times that that crime occurs mm -hmm. a crime has been committed is being committed or is about to be committed mm -hmm. we can't arrest we're not, we're not the future police mm -hmm. so but if you would stop him and got his information then you probably could have prevented that from happening absolutely so the detention can occur for a crime that is about to occur but no arrest can take place for a crime that's about to occur outside of an attempt when you're dangerously close. We, we, we talked about inchoate crimes. The detention alone could be a deterrent for other crimes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody's that, that close to, to breaking law. It, you is reasonably going to continue that behavior immediately upon being released while the officer is still standing there. Um, So when it comes to now, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna go again to an extreme on this story, and I think I've, I've beaten a dead horse on why I'm going to extremes. These stories aren't necessarily realistic stories, but we have to prove legal points. Now, in this story, that person has a cold face. They are a door-to-door -door crowbar salesman, and they, uh, their grandma lives behind Lowe's, and this is the path they take every day. In fact, there's video of them doing it every single day. They carry them. They only had one crowbar they didn't sell. They sold all their other crowbars. Uh, and and they have a condition, even though it's 80 degrees, the doctor uh, has, has a game of doctor's note that they have cold face syndrome, and that's why they wear a mask. In that case, after you find all that out, is it reasonable to assume that we were wrong, that this person was breaking in? Yeah, after you find out. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so we're all on the same page that, we, that we, were, we were probably wrong. Does that make that detention unlawful? No. Were the officers allowed to still stop them even though they were wrong? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because you don't know what you have. Okay. And it's reasonable suspicion. Right. Do the officers have to bat a thousand in reasonable suspicion? No. no. But I mean, one, so one, I mean, once the, the person dispels whatever suspicion they have, I mean, should be over. There we go. Once they dispel whatever it is, once we realize that there's, once the, the government realizes there is no crime, then the person is let go. There is no arrest. The officer, the government, doesn't have to be 100% right every single time. As long as we go back to that definition wherein a reasonable person would have believed that they are involved in a crime. And then later, some more information came out and said, oh, I guess they're not. But at the time that detention was affected, a reasonable person, and we all consider ourselves very reasonable, we would have believed that, yeah, anybody who saw that first start, that first half of the story that I told, any reasonable person is going to think, oh, yeah, that, that person's probably breaking into the room. Or doing something. They're up to no good. Because we don't know exactly, we don't need to know exactly what they're doing. That idea of being wrong is also crucial. Once more information comes out, like Ms. Wall said, then we're done. The investigation is complete. That's the whole point of doing that detention is up to investigate and find out. But if the other side happens, 
he stopped that individual and they, they immediately began telling the, the officers, oh yeah, I was, I was getting ready to break into this place right here. In fact, I uh, did it last week and I did it the week before. Uh, it's just, just what I do. No, I don't have any permission. In fact, I, I wish they wouldn't stop break. I wish we wouldn't stop fixing this door and make it a lot easier for me. But yeah, I gotta bring my crowbar because keep fixing the door. Well, mm, does that bad. officer, is there a fair probability that, that person was breaking into that, yeah. that place? It's their probability. Right. Yeah. But because then, well, I'll, change it. It. I'll change it a little bit because I gave you that, that past one. But is it a fair probability that, that person was the person who broke into the Lowe's last week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They said they were. That's, that's a fair probability. Are we are we but, comfortable with affecting that arrest on that individual? No, but wouldn't you be trying to do something? Because if somebody, if you stop somebody, they're really telling you something like that, and they would have like a mental health issue. Like there would be an underlying issue or something like that. You're really taking away the reasonability of my removal of the gray <laughs> area there. <laughs> now, if you want to talk about realism, sure, there could be a mental health issue. But as, as I stated, in order to prove these legal points, we have to remove the gray area and we have to really live in the legal extremes while all of us in real life don't live in legal extremes. We live in the middle. But legal points have to be proven using extremes. Well, I think I learned in your classroom last semester that um, I could come and tell you, yeah, I sell drugs and this and that. And that don't give you the uh, a reasonable suspicion to arrest me right then and there. Yeah, I sell drugs. I sold it to them the other day. You know, I'm about to sell something in the minute. You know, but that don't give you a reason to search me or 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 to arrest. me. To arrest. Me. No, it doesn't give you to arrest. It doesn't okay. give me a reason to arrest. Yeah, okay. So if you tell me right now. if you tell me that you sell drugs, you're selling drugs right now, you sold drugs last week, does a reasonable person believe that you're selling drugs right now? Yeah. A reasonable person would believe that. But I can't arrest you unless what? Yeah. Unless I corroborate that in right. information. Merely telling me you did it. So in that story with Lowe's. We have a little bit more corroboration, right? We got a person that's already in the back. They're, they're dressing like a burglar. They are training. The government's training and experience has told them those officers have been trained and they've seen burglars and they know how burglars act and dress. So they can say that person that was in, the, in that, that alleyway, they're dressing the same way and they're acting the same way the burglar acts. That's part of their reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. Also, Lowe's has been broken into last week. And there's a crime report on file. They're, they're back there. So they're, you are corroborating that information. As opposed to just a stranger coming up and telling you, you're absolutely right. Mere statement of a crime is not enough for arrest. There has to be an action as well. Words and actions. Or just actions. But words alone, not enough. Yes, ma'am. So let's say you told him that. And he decided to detain you. He would have every right to detain you because... Being that you just said, oh, I'm about to go over here and do this. It could be on your person. Or, yeah, I'm going to tell them all that. Right, but still, like, it still be reasonable. So that, that's, that you bring up, uh, it's like you read my mind. We're going to talk about, that's the last subject we're going to talk about. And when we talk about uh, Miranda, I'm going to go back and revisit Miranda. The idea that the fact that the rights weren't read I mean, it's not advised of the Miranda rights. We already said it's not a loophole to mere arrest. Right. However, if there is interrogation or custody plus interrogation, then Miranda mm -hmm. is necessary. Mm -hmm. However, that does not preclude unsolicited confessions. And those come in a few different ways. There are a few exceptions to Miranda. Custody plus interrogation equals Miranda. So in this situation uh, that Mr. Wall said, if that burglar is taken into custody, and we're going to say custody, not just detained, we're going to put handcuffs on, custodial restraints on this suspected burglar. And the officer is on the radio and they're waiting for another officer to get there because they want to see if there's the door's been broken into, whatever. So just standing there next to the suspected burglar, not talking to them, writing down a, a plan. Okay, when the officer gets here, I want to take notes because I'm a very studious officer. Okay, I don't want to forget this. When that other officer gets here, I'm going to ask them to go check the door. I'm going to ask the next officer, hey, can you, I'm going to, I'm going to have them call the manager. And so I'm writing down my notes, all the things I want to do. Hush right now, burglar, I'm, I'll get you in a second. I, I, I'm trying to take notes. And the burglar, while I'm writing those notes, that burglar says, hey, uh, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I just want to let you know I'm, I'm a burglar. And in fact, uh, not only burglar, I broke into that house last week across the way, and I killed that lady too. 
I'm like, I'm trying to write some notes here, man. You're interrupting me. But you look up, and the, the officer looks up, and the burglar just keeps spilling more and more milk. I broke into that house. I broke into, in fact, I, I would guess in the last couple months, I probably broken into 50 houses at night. Uh, I only killed like 30 of the people, though. I'm not crazy. <laughs> so at that point, do we have custody? What was that? I said the burglar was was stopped and put into handcuffs. Do we have custody? Yes. We have custodial restraints. Do you have custody plus interrogation? There we go. There was no interrogation. It was unsolicited, like like Mr. Walsh said. Unsolicited. There is no violation of Miranda at this point because there was no interrogation to go along their custody. That was what can be called a spontaneous statement or a spontaneous utterance allowable in, in court. It has to be both custody and interrogation. If that burglar or that suspect who was being detained or being or was in custody decides to just spill their guts with no questions asked, that's on them. That is an exception to Miranda. Now, if that officer says, no way. Tell me more. What? Yeah. Wait, when did you do that? You did that last all month? Last month or this month? Now do we have interrogation? Yeah. yeah. Now there's a violation of Miranda. But if you just, just continue, just chats one way, then there's no, there's no Miranda. Exactly what you said. It's, it's, it's unsolicited, but law. Uh, some co other couple exceptions to Miranda that uh, we'll go into probably later in the semester, but I'll touch on briefly. Uh, public safety is an exception to Miranda. You don't necessarily uh, have to be advised as a member of the public by the government of Miranda rights if the information being solicited is for the safety of the public, kind of like those exigent circumstances that go into a house. So if, uh, if somebody runs down the street, with a gun in their hand and two police officers are chase them, they go around the corner and when the officers aren't looking, they throw the gun into a yard and keep running. Officers catch up to attack them and take them to custody. No more gun. One, they, the officers want to know where that gun is because it was, you know, we don't want people running down the street with guns in their hands. Why else do the officers want to know where that gun is? Because they got to figure out if it's been used. They want to find out what it's been used, absolutely. So they want to find out if it's been used in a crime. What happens if, so he threw in the yard, what, what bad can happen in that yard? He could wake up and find a gun in the front yard and start playing with it and some back it up. Right? And then they needed so the to public, back them up. And he, they needed to back them up for why they stopped that person. I'm sorry? They need the gun to back them up. So yes, for why absolutely part of that wanting to know where that gun is, is to know if there's a crime. That is absolutely part of it. And if that was the only part, then there would need to be a, there would need to be a Miranda. However, we also, as the public, expect the government to protect us, and we don't want guns in front yards that kids can find. And so that public safety exception says that the officer can ask them outside of Miranda and say, where is the gun you threw? We need to find that gun. Somebody's going to get hurt. And that is exception, and that evidence can still be used. Uh, and then the final uh, exception we'll talk about, uh, although maybe not the, the only not the last one that, that exists is dying declarations if somebody believes that they are dying then those statements can still be used even if they don't die if it's reasonable to believe that the person's dying they, they believe that they're dying and they give some statements outside of Miranda those statements can also be used. Uh, pretty minor uh pretty rare occurrence but still awfully significant any questions on what we discussed today 